And that's true of our God. He is an always kind of God. You can't count on him sometimes, occasionally, always. It's one of the manifestations of his being a faithful God. And we're looking today as we, we're getting back into the Mark study. We looked a few Sundays ago at the passage leading up to this. Jesus' triumphal entry, approaching a fig tree, fully in bloom, no fruit. He cursed it. We're going to read a couple of verses leading up to the passage we're going to study today just to remind you of the context. We're going to look at, at this challenge that Jesus gives his followers and he gives us today. Have faith. Have faith in God. Because he's a faithful God. He can be counted on. He does not disappoint. When we, are fi we find ourselves disappointed, we have missed his will. Because he never disappoints. Find in your Bibles, please, Mark chapter 11, verses 22 to 26. Now let me tell you, some of your versions are not going to have verse 26. There's a, there's a dispute about whether or not that is an authentic verse in that passage. Now, I've, I've reminded you in the past, when we come upon situations like this, if I'm going to err in this, <clears throat> I'm going to err hanging on to the verse. Because Jesus says this, very same thing in Matthew. I'll let the textual critics sort it out. But when I stand before God, I'd rather get rebuked for believing the most about the Word than finding myself in a situation where I would pick and choose. So I'm going to read verse 26, even though it's not in some of your versions. You'll find it in a footnote in some of the versions. Stand with me if you would. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we're going to put the text on the screen, but we, we've got Bibles for you. We want you to have your own copy of the Scripture, to read it for yourself. Follow along as I read Mark chapter 11. We're going to read verses 20 through 26, though, so follow along. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. This is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We need to embrace this passage and hug it tightly because it's been greatly misused and abused by many people in so-called evangelicalism today. Thank you. Please be seated. William Hendrickson in his commentary on, on Mark talks about the chronology going on here and he says that this is the Tuesday of Passion Week. This, it follows the triumphal entry and on Palm Sunday and Jesus is headed to the cross. In about a 24-hour period, Jesus cursed the blooming fig tree. 24 hours later, it's withered to the core. One, common, one, one, one version says root and stem. What we learn from this passage, because it's been, it's been greatly abused, there are people who take this passage and read it, rip it out of context, and remember now a text taken out of context as a pretext. They rip it out of context. They don't consider the other teachings of Jesus on the matter of prayer, and they make it a, what you call a name it and claim it. All you got to do is just believe enough, and you'll get whatever you ask. That's not what's being taught here. 
The level of our belief is not the focus. The faithfulness of God is the focus. And he mixes into this, this passage so that we do not misunderstand that the heart that prays believing must be filled with love that forgives. Just look at this text under, under these headings. First of all, God must be the focus of faith, verse 22. Second, God must be believed as willing to answer our prayers, verse 23. Third, God must be believed as having already determined to answer our prayers, verse 24. And then fourth, the connection between a forgiving spirit and answers to our prayers, verses 25 and 26. God must be the focus of faith. You know, the way you hear some people talk, they get interviewed every now and then on TV when, when something tragic happens and they make it through a tragedy or, 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 and they say, well, I just, I just never stopped believing. I just, kept, I just kept on believing. The way some people talk, it's almost like you, you're supposed to have faith in faith, that if you just have enough faith that, that you're impervious to, to life. If you just have enough, muster up enough faith, only good things happen and everything you want to happen happens. And that's not, Jesus doesn't say have faith in faith. Have faith in God. Peter has just remarked, not as a rebuke, but as an astonishment. Rabbi, look, the tree you cursed is already withered. With the, with the implied question, how can that be? How could something go from full bloom to utter death overnight? And Jesus doesn't come in on the tree. As he often does, he teaches what no one is really asked to learn. Have faith in God. And everything he says from this point in this, in this portion is about having faith in God. He's not teaching name it and claim it. He's not teaching muster up enough faith and you can make things happen. He's teaching that the answer to what you, Peter, think is a, is a powerful, uh, quick demonstration traces back to the power of God. Remember, Jesus is teaching, is taught in the Gospels, if you weave them together, he, he will say things like, I say nothing except the Father gives it to me to say. I, I can do nothing except the Father enables me and instructs me to... I, I am totally at the mercy and the behest of God my Father. Well, you see, we are too. My pastor friend Sam Tullock, I think I've told you this before, was, was preaching one time on, on the sovereignty of God and, and His power and how we need, to, we need to plead for mercy. So this woman came up to him after the service and said, Pastor, if what you said is true, then we're just at the mercy of God. And in his, in his Texas drawl, he said, That's right, honey. We're at the mercy of God. And, and Jesus wants to show the disciples that. And think about, I mean, think of the things that's happened. They've seen power. They, they have been involved in the miraculous demonstration of power. They've come back from, from a mission where, where they went out two by two and said, the demons, the demons were subject to us. Well, it's important that they never forget the, the rest of that because of the power of God. They were subject to God, and God was pleased to use you as instruments. And so, the focus has got to be, the focus of faith must be on God. I, I came across this, I thought, this was, well, faith is, what is faith? Faith is the soul's window through which God's love comes pouring in. Faith is the open hand whereby man reaches out to God, the giver. Faith is the coupling that links man's train to God's engine. Faith is the trunk of salvation's tree whose root is grace 
and whose fruit is good works. Blossoming faith. Vital faith. You'll do a panoramic look at over the scriptures. What was faith? Faith was Abraham, the means of Abraham's justification. By faith, Abraham believed God. Faith was the, this writer says, the magnet that drew Moses away from the pleasures of Egypt so that he threw in his lot with God's afflicted people. Faith was the force that overthrew Jericho's wall. The secret that enabled Ruth to make her stirring confession. The, the weapon that killed Goliath and destroyed Sennacherib's host. The, the deciding factor in, in Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The shield that protected Job in the midst of his trials. The muzzle that closed the mouth of Daniel's lions. The remedy that cured the centurion's servant and many others in the ministry of Jesus. We know that faith is a gift of God. By grace you've been saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And that not of yourselves. Well, what's the that? We've, looked, we've done this when we went through Ephesians, but just real quickly, when you, when you practice good grammar, you have to ask the question, what does, to, to what does that refer? And when you go back, rule of antecedents, faith. And really, we've, when we looked at that, we showed you that because of the package there, it's grace, salvation, faith, that does not originate in us. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith is a gift of God. Which is why we're enabled to exercise faith. Paul said to the Philippians, to you it's been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but also to suffer for his name. And so Paul, just as a matter of fact, in passing, says it's been not only been given to you to believe, but to suffer. And so, so faith is a gift of God, and that's why the focus must be on God. We're enabled to believe when we're born again, when, when the new birth comes to us. I've told you before about, I didn't get to be in the delivery room with, with all of the children. The, the first couple of births were hospitals that were sort of backward and so I my role was, one was to sit in the most uncomfortable chair in the world and look up at two little light bulbs one was blue and one was pink now that particular labor took care of I think 10 hours I, I, I fell asleep on the most uncomfortable chair in the world and woke up with a crick in my neck that to this day no chiropractor can fix it. But the light finally went off. Didn't do much better for the second. But the third. No, in fact, I was in on the third. I was in on the third. And what an amazing thing. To see a baby born and watch all the pictures of the new birth come the first, what do you, when a baby's being born, what do you want to hear? You want to hear the cry. You want to hear the cry of life. Not, I, I wasn't sitting there thinking, well, the, the baby cried. That's why she was born. No, no, no. The baby cried. It's evidence that she has been born. Faith is a gift of God. And that's why the focus must be in God. Don't buy into this stuff. But if you just believe enough, no, if you, if you fix and focus your, your faith in God, it's amazing how your life will be drawn into the stream of the will of God. For, secondly, God must be believed as willing to answer our prayers. We're an interesting lot, aren't we? We prayed in, in prayer meetings when we were just earnestly crying out to God to move. And then we may get a report that there's movement. And we wonder. It's very much like the early church that was crying out to God for Peter's 
release from prison and there was a knock at the door where the prayer meeting was going on and the young girl went to the door and came back and said, Peter's at the door. Shh, we're praying for Peter. Don't even have to prayer me. Must be believed. Jesus says in verse 23, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, James teaches us to ask in faith, not doubting. But believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. There, there may be, he's talking about the Mount of Olives being thrown into the Dead Sea. It's a, some, one commentator said that it would be about a plunge of about 4,000 feet suddenly. And what Jesus is teaching here, when you, when you set the context, allow for, for Scripture to interpret Scripture, is that no task, get this now, no task that is in harmony with God's will is impossible to be performed by those who believe and do not doubt. You see, doubting faith, people, there's a, there's a character in Pilgrim's Progress called Little Faith. And Little Faith is on the way to the Celestial City, and Little Faith makes it to the Celestial City by the hardest. So doubting faith is not necessarily false faith, but it's not overcoming faith. It's not faith in such a way in God that God delights in answering our prayers. When we pray for our children, the salvation of our children, we pray for the salvation of our grandchildren, of our loved ones, of our kinsmen, of our, of our neighbors, our friends, our enemies. We need to come to that believing that God is more willing to do what we're asking that, that seems to line up with His revealed will than we are even willing to ask. This is the God we serve. He is not a stingy God. He's a generous God. He's... Every one of us will be able to say at the end of our lives, by God's grace, your goodness and mercy has followed me all the days of my life. And my next step is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because He's faithful. We persevere because He preserves. He's able to keep us from falling. To save us to the uttermost. To bring us safely home to our heavenly harbor. The linking of faith and prayer. We need to rebuke ourselves and rebuke one another when we, when we pray just going through the motions and we're not, not pleading the mercy and the promises and the power of God in our petitions, believing Him for who he's revealed himself to be. Third, God must be believed as having already determined to answer our prayers. This, this is really a step further. He says, ask in faith without doubting, believing that you will have. Here, he says in verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have, have, have received it. And it will be yours. Folks, that's difficult. Because we, we, we tend to be focused in on sight and sound. And yet, if what we're praying as we see the Scriptures is in keeping with God's revealed will, then we need to, we need to believe that God has done it. You know, this is not the only place this occurs. When, in, in Matthew's Gospel, when, when Jesus is teaching on church discipline, 
He tells them that what you bind on earth in, in, the, in the practice of church discipline has already been bound in heaven. That's a confidence booster. That's an encouragement. When we pray about God moving in the lives of people, when we pray about God acting, we need to believe as we pray that He is way ahead of us. I heard one speaker say recently, he said, we pray for a move of God, but we need to realize that we are the move of God. We're the ones God has placed to advance His kingdom's cause, and, and we go. When Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, we go. And if we discover hell's gates prevailing anywhere, it is, it is a reflection more on the advance of the church than it is on the power of God and, and His glory in the gospel. Do you pray like that? You pray for the salvation of an adult child? Do, do we really think that we want a kinsman of ours saved more than God does? Believe that you have received it. Now, it's not, not going to be on our timetable. God doesn't operate by our time. He operates on His time. And so the challenge we have is we pray believing and then acting is that we tie into God's timetable. And I submit to you that's difficult because there are so many people out there who have abused this principle that our response typically is to back away from whatever people abuse. Well, okay, fine. Back away from what people abuse, but don't back away from the reality and the truth taught in the Scripture. Embrace that. And manifest the power of this promise. Trusting God. Believing God. Having faith in God. Even though the pathway may be difficult. And then, verse 25, this, and I believe 26, the connection between the forgiving spirit and answers to our prayers and it's really interesting because this, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with a withered fig tree and a mountain, the image of a mountain thrown, the Mount of Olives thrown in, to the sea. And yet it has everything to do with it. But you see, this teaching delivers us from presumption when we pray. Verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And Jesus links again. He does it in the, the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. He does it in other teaching in the Gospels. He links a spirit of forgiveness to prayer. We're going to see something very much akin to this, Lord willing, on, on Father's Day Sunday. when Peter gives an admonition to husbands. Forgive. Now, I've taught you here before that as we've looked at passages like this, that, that when you think of forgiveness in the Scripture, you need to think in terms of what we would call the, the formal act of forgiveness, which cannot take place until someone repents to you. And the, and, and the functional spirit of forgiveness. Jesus displayed it on the cross. 
as he was hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now those people, when Jesus spoke that of his executors, they were not forgiven by God right there. In fact, they were, they were cut to the heart later on in, on Pentecost and, and cried out, what must we do to... What must we do? You're right, Peter. We, we see. We, we killed the Lord of glory. What must we do? And he said, repent. And be converted. Jesus is teaching here a spirit of forgiveness. Now, in another, another place in Matthew's Gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, he teaches that if you, if you come to worship and remember that you have ought against your brother. Go, leave your gift at the altar and go and find your brother and, and repent. Formal forgiveness. Don't treat worship so lightly that you come into it with a hard heart toward others. Here is the spirit of forgiveness. When you stand praying, forgive. You remember, say, oh Lord, I do forgive so and so. Because you've forgiven me so much. This is that's the story he tells in Matthew's gospel. How dare I come into the presence of God with an unforgiving spirit? Now, this person may have wronged you. And you can pray for them. You can maybe even approach them and say, I need to I need to say this to you. you I've been offended by you. And depending on their heart and their spiritual state. They either get more agitated than they were or they may break. But regardless of their response, your spirit has got to be a forgiving spirit because Jesus teaches that if not, then, then we who have unforgiving spirits are handed over to tormentors and your prayer life will grow up in smoke. When you stand praying. Why would God grant answer to someone who treats the blood of Jesus Christ so trivially? Why would God grant answer to someone who treats the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives so trivially? Christ purchased our redemption. The Spirit dwells in us to, to lead us into all truth, to teach us, to rebuke us when we sin, so that we repent when we sin and we ask forgiveness. And He gives us this heart, this new heart, this, this partaker of the divine nature, Peter says, to be a reflection of the character and the glory of God. And there's no place in our lives for unforgiveness. And could it be If you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. One other word about functional forgiveness and formal forgiveness. If you're not practicing functional forgiveness, forgiving in your, in your heart even though someone's wronged you, when, and when they do come to you and say, I need to repent to you, if you've not been doing that, your heart's going to be hard and it's going to be more of a payback deal than, than forgiveness. But if you've been practicing functional forgiveness, you say, I do forgive you. I do forgive you. I, in, in the language of Jesus, I've been, I've been forgiven a $5 million debt. I'm not going to hold your $5 debt over you. I forgive you. And you can speak forgiveness, and, and speaking forgiveness to someone is freeing and liberating, and, and walls fall down. But here he's talking about this. You stand praying. And a person who is practicing forgiveness will not be like the full-blossomed fig trees. Jesus, one last lesson on it. The full-blossomed fig tree appeared to be something it wasn't. Christian, you and I cannot afford to appear to be something that we're not. To on the outside appear to be kind and wonderful and charming and winsome and, and caring and on the inside be bitter and, and hard and cold and unforgiving. What Jesus did to the fig tree was, was cursed it and it withered 
from, from the outside in. But if we do not forgive, we will wither from the inside out. And forgiving people becomes a powerful climate for a praying people to see a powerful move of God. Moving powerfully in us, using us, descending upon us, giving answer to our petitions like we've never imagined. Because you see, when we finish praying all that we know to pray, we've prayed to Him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything that we know how to ask or think. He is able to do that. And rather than question the willingness of God, I think we've got to get back to what Jesus is teaching here and question our hearts. Oh Lord, is there anything in me that, that your Spirit would look upon and would, would call it a hindrance, a reason for you not to move? Lord, dis discover that in me and remove it. So what do we learn from this passage, just real quickly? First of all, fruitlessness invites a curse. Second, genuine faith results in answered prayer. Third, such faith inspires hope. Firmly entrenched in God's infallible promise. You see, that's, it's hopeful praying. Our first parent, Adam, was hopeful in the face of great consequences. After God pronounced what was going to happen to the serpent, to the man, to the woman, Adam heard in that hope, and here was the hope, God is not going to kill me now. Just strike me dead. And he said, I will call her Eve. For she shall be mother of all the living ones. We're going we're to live to have children. Hope. Such faith inspires hope. Because you see, when all is said and done, faith focused in God is believing the promise of God, having confidence in the promises of God, having confidence in the power of God. That no matter what you're going through, the, the songs that Josh led us in. If we belong to Jesus Christ, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Finally, this faith is climaxed by love. Love that manifests itself in many ways, but chiefly here in a forgiving spirit. So anyone you don't forgive today? Anyone you haven't forgiven? Anyone you're holding a grudge against? Forgive. Now you can't formally forgive them until they repent. That's when the transaction takes place. But right now in your heart, you can forgive. You can ask God for the grace to forgive. And it will free you up and you won't wither from the inside out and take on the appearance of a withered fig tree. Do you have such faith? Do you have such faith? It is the fruit of saving faith. It's the fruit of a life submitted to God. Trusting in His name, His person, His work, His power, His promises. And He offers that freely. He offers that freely. You say, well, I need Him, preacher. There's a great hymn we've sung here several times, Come You Sinners. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of 
some, no, some notion of your own personal fitness, don't, nor a fitness fondly dream. Don't, don't have visions of that. All the fitness He requires is to feel your need of Him. And then the song says, and this He gives you, you see. When you feel your need of Him, that's the birth of faith in the heart. And this He gives you, it is the Spirit's rising beam. Have faith in God. He's a faithful God. And will be so to the end. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, You gave Jesus Christ To show us your love. To show us your wrath against sin. And your willingness to forgive every sinner who trusts in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for those here today who, who have not yet come to do that. That your Spirit would show them what a faithful God you are. Convince them that you are willing and able to save and that you would save those here who are yet outside of Christ. For those of us who know you, Lord, forgive us when we live with wobbly faith. Forgive us when we express faith with doubting. Help us to believe in You. That Your Word is true. Your promises are sure. Your power is unequaled and undeniable. Help us, Lord, to live as men and women and boys and girls of faith in a faithless generation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we close out the service today.
Be seated for just a moment. We're excited to share with you that uh, Jared and Sarah James are coming to present themselves for membership and apply for membership in our congregation. They've been able to be with us now. How long have you been attending? Two, two months, two or three months. And, and uh, you had the blessing of hearing him preach a couple of Sundays ago, and you're going to have that blessing again this next Sunday, Lord willing. Uh, Karen and I will be out. Uh, and he's going to bring the Word of God, and I know that you're going to be blessed. And I would encourage you, bring family and friends with you. Bring them with you. Uh, put them under the preaching of the Gospel. You can't do any, any greater thing, any kinder thing for family, friends, neighbors, co-workers. Bring them under the preaching of the Gospel. And uh, we're going to let you come by in a, f a few moments and just express your joy and, and delight and promise your prayers for them uh, as the Lord uh, plants them here. And then we'll see what God has in store for them. We continue to pray for them that the Lord will, will plant a Jared uh, in a pastorate. Uh, that's his heart's desire. But what a blessing that we have to have them here uh, as long as the Lord wants to have them here. And so we're going we're gonna to stand together uh, Pray you have a wonderful week. Uh, share the good news with somebody. Share the good news. You know, Memorial Day evokes a lot of emotions. It, it evokes, on the one hand, the, how many people have given their lives so that we could be free. And, and if, you're, if you're an evangelical Christian, you almost immediately think, and look how we tend to want to squander these freedoms. And the squandering of freedom purchased by blood uh, is, becomes licentiousness and a bondage of the worst type. Yet we are free in Christ. And we can speak of real freedom. Freedom that delivers. Freedom that blesses. Freedom, freedom that protects. So be sure and, and, and give thanks to God that we live in the freest, still the freest nation on the face of the earth, even though, even though you can see, you can, you can sense freedoms eroding around us. And then live as free men and women and boys and girls in Jesus Christ. Because you're going to meet, meet people this next week who are in bondage. They've celebrated our freedom and they're in bondage. They've debauched the celebration of our freedom and they're in bondage. And we have the word of life. We have the word to set them free if they will hear Jesus Christ and take him at his word. Jared, if you and Sarah would come and stand here, your, your family, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to stand to be dismissed. All right. Stand with me if you will. Josh, will you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for this Lord's Day. Thank you for the worship that you've given us together as a, a church family. And I thank you for this family here, for Jared and Sarah and, her, and their little ones. And uh, they've already been a blessing to us. They've come in and, and already began, begun to serve. And, and uh, God, help us to serve them as a family of faith, to, to love them and to care for them and um, to, to take care of their needs and, and uh, just that you would grow, continue to grow this congregation so that we can care for more people um, and help us to be ready to do that. We thank you for the word today. We thank you for the very simple and powerful gospel uh, of life and of freedom. And I pray that we would be quick to live it out and quick to speak it and to quick to, to act in love to our neighbors and to our friends and to those that we meet as we go throughout the week. Help us to edify and encourage and love one another as we, as we go from this place. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. tragedy or, or, or and they said well I just I just never stopped believing I just kept, I just kept on believing and the way some people talk it's almost like you, you you're supposed to have faith in faith that if you just have enough faith that that you're impervious to to life if you just have enough muster up enough faith 
Only good things happen and everything you want to happen happens. And that's not, Jesus doesn't say have faith in faith. Have faith in God. Peter has just remarked, not as a rebuke, but as an astonishment. Rabbi, look, the tree you cursed is already with you. With the, with the implied question, how can that be? How could something go from full bloom to utter death overnight? And Jesus doesn't comment on the tree. As he often does, he teaches what no one is really asked to learn. Have faith in God. And everything he says from this point in this, in this portion is about having faith in God. He's not teaching name it and claim it. He's not teaching muster up enough faith and you can make things happen. He's teaching that the answer to what you, Peter, think is a, is a powerful, uh, quick demonstration traces back to the power of God. Remember, Jesus is teaching, is taught in the Gospels, if you weave them together, he, he will say things like, I say nothing except the Father gives it to me to say. I, I can do nothing except the Father enables me and instructs me. to. I, I am totally at the mercy and the behest of God my Father. And you see, we are too. My pastor friend Sam Tullock, I think I've told you this before, was preaching one time on, on the sovereignty of and that's true of our God. <laughs>